to set the tone for um, our panel together. I will not take a, a lot of time because it will be a great conversation just uh, between us. Um, just a, a few minutes on, uh, on leadership in business and what actually that means. Um, leadership in business is, is the capacity of a company's management to set and achieve challenging goals. Um, take fast and decisive action um, when needed, but outperform the competition and inspire others to perform at the highest level they can. And when I when I was thinking about leadership in business and, and what to talk about and thinking about that we have two really different uh, people in this panel from a very different background. So I'll just give you a couple of examples of what we're doing in, in Kirkland Hospitality. So 75% of our executive team are women, but not because we wanted a tick list or because we developed something, but simply because they were best in class and the right people for the job. 50% um, of the leadership team is female and 35% is diversified. And again, I just started counting just based on, on the conversations we're having, but it was just the right fit for what we're doing. For every three leaders, we bring on one Generation Z handpicked and fully integrated to work with us and never to just make coffee and print paper, but really to integrate into our team. We balance between hiring for character and specialization. So we're looking for people who can really build with us this team, but also people who come with an incredible skill set. Um, we're expecting that accountability and performance are self-driven. Now, I did learn something from Mark's presentation, but within the, the culture that we've set up, this is really where we're trying to hit to. Remote and global, but still um, relevant and close to the action. So not just whenever, wherever, but really targeted um, when we talk about working remote or rem working global. Purpose and agility um, as a necessity, not as a luxury. We know that we have a responsibility in every location we land and operate. And that's not just a, a responsibility to ourselves, but a responsibility to everybody around. And I think this really comes up with, um, you know, what, what new age kind of leadership um, looks like and, and a leader in business nowadays is being a leader of the future. A few facts to, to think about before we go into the panel is 80% of the leaders today fail to impress in the first two years of their leadership roles. I mean, the stress that that must bring is insane because 70% of leaders admit they're actually really stressed. People only stay four years in a role and Gen Z, or let's say from millennial onwards, um, it's only three years. So you have a very, very little time span to impress people, engage them, bring them together, keep them and perform. Um, so with that said, I would love to bring back um, both Mark and Ashley and actually look at organizations and sport next to Welcome back. Um, and just diving straight into this, um, setting the tone uh, before, um, Ashley, starting with you, when you look at, um, you know, your line of business, there's only winning and losing. Um, how do you, how do you see that, that, you know, that you can apply that or how we can apply that as a, as a leadership skill set for, you know, any other business? Yeah, thanks, Marlowe. Actually, I, I'm I'm going to start by contradicting you. Actually, I, you know, I, winning and losing are very important parts of what we do. But probably the 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 key bit to me, and, and uh, you know, our, our overall vision, my vision when I came into this role for, for was was for us to be the best and most respected team in the world. And and I I don't think um, you can underestimate the importance of that respected bit. In fact, we could we could actually just say we want to be the most respected team in the world because, you know, as you say, in our game, winning and losing are, are absolutely, you know, part of what we do. But also important to me is, is, is that thing around culture development, our people, of the right behaviours, because that ultimately underpins everything we do. Um, you know, if you, 
you could be really well respected, but losing everything. No, no, no you couldn't. No, because that, that that is part of the bigger picture. You know, the, the, the winning and doing it the right way is all part of what we do. That's that is very much our belief, um, and is very much the culture now. That you know, one of the things we're seeing with our environment. And I know I'm moving on to culture rather than winning and losing is for the first time ever in a professional environment that I've been involved in is that we're seeing culture development from the top down as well as the bottom up. So it's been driven by the players, but being managed as well at the top by which, which is, you know, it's necessary. It has to work both ways. But so often, you know, we see culture development driven by us at the top. We put we put words on the wall that just turn into meaningless wallpaper. That no one believes, but we have um, a group of players now who are truly driving a very strong performance culture from the bottom up. And, and ultimately, when things go bad, when you start losing, that's what you fall back on. If it's only about winning and losing, you have nothing to fall back on in those difficult times. It's actually interesting, Mark. Do you want to jump into that? Because you were talking about the, the destination. Um, and if even in sports, like not even in sports, but I mean, you're talking about a sports team and you're talking about team culture and that being much more than, you know, the, the, the kind of stereotypical idea that we have that, you know, everybody just goes on the field, wins, and it's fantastic, goes on the field, loses, and that's the end of it. Yeah. You know, how are you looking at that? Yeah, I mean, I, I really understand what I actually say. I mean, I, I particularly agree with the point about leadership role modeling. I'll say something about that in just a sec. But I mean, for, for business, I guess the equivalent of winning is, you know, the sales profit vision that you, you might have sort of um, outlined. But we always say that you've got to measure two things. You've got to measure the what and the how. So the what would be, you know, winning in that analogy or taking a certain amount of sales and profit. But the how is the, is the values, the behaviors, the way in which you play the game, if you like. And so I think both are really important because there's, there's you know, um, if you're trying to build a culture, it has to have a set of behaviours associated with it, as, as well as a set of aspirations. But this point about leadership role modelling, it's interesting, you know, wherever you look in the research, it's it's foundational. And in all the, the work that I've done over the years with culture change in organisations, change goes at the speed of the leader. And so, <clears throat> in a sense, it's easier to get change, or it's easy to get change if the top team are genuinely committed not just in their words, but in their actions. Uh, so if they're living it out day in, day out, that's the thing that will actually bring about change. I mean, it's easy at the conference to say, hey, here's the big message, here's where we're going next, here's the direction. But then what people do is they just watch your actions day in, day out. And so, I mean, most of the work that, most of the time that I spend on culture change programs is with the, the senior group, trying to get them to live out the stuff they're actually wanting their people to do. But how does that then apply to the, the famous work-life balance that people always talk about? It's something that, you know, in, in my world barely exists, but, you know, it, you're living something, you're living it, correct? It's just no longer work and life. But when you look right. at this year where people are, you know, there's just blurred lines and there's people that need the piece of balance and the piece of life and there's the people that need these different pieces. How does that go in to your to your culture piece that you're just describing? Because it sounds fantastic, but then how? Yeah, well, I mean, when you're talking about day in, day out in, in the organisational setting, living it is when people can see you. So that doesn't mean it's every single um, moment of your life in time, let's say, because, you know, you can still have stuff that you're doing outside of, of work that people aren't seeing. But it can't be an act. So, you know, when you walk in the door, you don't switch on. A, These are now the behaviours I've been told I have to do and I'm going to role model. You know, it has to be a bit deeper. You've got to believe in it. So there's, there's no point in telling your people about some brave new world that you yourself are not wholeheartedly committed to. Um, I mean, you see Ashley sort of <laughs> nodding. And, and, I, and I think, um, you know, that means you never want to cast a vision that you're not genuinely, passionately all in for because you know people will work it out you know they'll they'll see through it you know whether you think you're you're great at doing the right thing or not they'll see whether it really is your your heartbeat so you know it's it's not that it has to encroach every second of your life although i would say you know although there's much talked about life balance and it can be achieved and ashley might have a view on this you'll know from elite level sport much better than i will do if you're going to be the absolute best at anything you have no balance i mean you know there's a sense of 
there's a single-minded focus. That's you know, if you're the CEO of a major organization, you know, there, there's not only a lot of time left for loads of other stuff either, and that's not a very palatable message in, in modern culture, but it but it is sort of true as well. So, elite yeah, this performs exactly anything. Are, sorry, go on, Marlis. No, this is exactly the point that I actually would like to bring it over to Ashley. Is you know, it sounds fantastic when you talk about the culture, etc., right? But when you live something, you really live it. So, you know, setting the tone, and if you live it every single day, that's what you're expecting from everybody else to a certain extent, you know, as well. Ashley, I don't know if you want to jump into that because I'm very curious to hear what you're thinking about work-life balance in, in your sector. Right now, I'm probably the worst person to ask because I'm not sure that we're, there's, there's a great deal of balance for any of us leaders. But actually, you know, if, if, if I refer to the three pillars of the player's culture, yeah. the courage, unity, and respect. So, you know, the courage is about stepping back when you need to. The respect is about allowing people to take time away from the environment when they need to. And in fact, what we see in our players or what I've seen and I've even seen in myself during my, my playing career is when you don't have any balance that's when the alarm bells really go off because our best players have clear balance of when they're on and when they're off. When they're on they're extremely professional, they get their job done, they cover all the bases, they're completely dedicated to the team. When they're away from the environment they can concentrate on their families, their children etc. When you get that crossed over and you're with your family and you're saying, oh, I should be practicing, I should be over there, and your mind's not in the moment, and when you're at cricket and you think, I should be at home, that's when we've got issues and, and uh, we've probably then mismanaged and we've probably missed the, the important step of, of intervention. Very interesting. I have a question actually staying with you. Do you see the role of management changing in the future with the new generations coming on? Um, yeah, look, so certainly. Um, again, this is a bit like the, my two wheels. There's, there are always within teams and with individuals, two separate wheels moving. And a lot of that is about you know, the maturity of environment. So as a manager, for me, you, you clearly have to adapt to the environment that's in front of you. So if you have a, a mature group of people, it's not just age, but knowing their jobs, knowing their roles, experience, you're able to take more of a step back and allow them to lead. But clearly, if you have a, a more immature group who are new, fresh, you're in transition as a team, then you probably need to take more of a lead, and particularly on things like culture. So the role modeling piece, but also almost a bit of a you know, a director at the top who stands there sometimes and says, I don't like that. I like that. Well done. That's not good. This is good. When those teams mature and they develop and they get to a level, you don't need to do that. And I, and I always talk about that as management made easy because you, you just let them fly. And that's when you have the the uh, the real success. Mark, do you agree with that? Do you actually uh, do you see a shift in the in the generation? Definitely in generations that having a different expectation from the kind of leader role or the manager role that could really create a shift in in the future. Yeah, I mean. Yes, and there's pretty clear research on this now as well, particularly around millennials as, as well as Gen Z, um, that there are some factually different things people are looking for. So millennials are technically the world's least engaged working population and they are the largest working population at the moment. Um, and the learning and growth is way more important to them. See, organisations in the past used to use traditional things like money as a motivator. People are more interested in meaning now. Boss was the you know the font of all knowledge. Now people are looking for somebody who's an enabler and can create the conditions for success and make it easier for people to win. Um, you know, let's think about performance management, where historically the annual review was the, the sort of you know the, the capstone of that. Now people have got all the world's information in the palm of their hand every second of the day, and so you know ongoing conversations are so much more important. So there's definite shifts, and those have been shifted by some of the global meta trends that are happening as well. You know. Obviously, you know, the internet, globalization, you know, racial and ethnic diversity with people migration. So there's some factually different things that are shaping the world of work. And so with organizations I'm working with, you know, trying to shift to leader as enabler rather than as instructor is, is a big thing. Um, you know, how, how do I create the conditions for success, make it easier for you to win? Now, you know, millennials and Gen Zs aren't brand new human beings, but they, they have grown up in a completely different world. 
and or most organizations were created by you know gen x and boomers and so those organizational cultures are created by those people and so they're not always a perfect fit for millennials gen z's so yeah there's there's definitely a need to to shift if you want to maximize emotional commitment because the highest staff turnover anywhere is in structure change can you see that there is because observing the change is one but then if i take hospitality for an example when you look at the hierarchical structure we're still looking at the same rules and the same kind of title okay we might have added the it tech specialist um but you know when we talk about ecosystems and communities when we talk about multitasking or people being bored of a of a you know a single task after 20 minutes you know that almost creates a, a need for a very different culture where i think between all the generations before there was always we don't like them and we don't like this but it's a it's a very significant change of somebody who goes through you know 25 applications in the speed of seconds and concentration span is wider than the narrow yeah i think that that is a real thing um i, I don't think that means that people can't concentrate but i think it is it's important important for leaders to help people understand why they would want to do things several times and, and almost get to a point of mastery because I, I think as you say people can be more flittish and skittish um, and so framing it as you know actually you know any excellence requires repetition and so you know 10,000 hours so you know if you, if you want to be a master at anything you have to do it a lot and so I mean that's that's a that's a way we usually frame that with people that you, you're not going to be good at anything without constant repetition but I do agree with you that I think it is a little trickier for some of the uh, the younger workforce although although you know like anything you don't want to be too cartoonish in talking about Millennials and Gen Z's is in saying you know that they they're defined by one singular set of differentials you know people are pretty rich and complex and so forth but yeah but th there are real shifts Marlos can I come in on that that point I think that you know there, there's there's clearly a difference nowadays but but um but there is still you know, one size doesn't fit all i think is the point i'm trying to make in that you know we still have players who who love detail who love you know to, to describe something in the in the most minute of detail to to them where we have players who you know be, br be brief be bright be gone you, you've got about a minute's worth of attention and and so you know simple shifts we use you know i, I remember our manager talking about players never read their emails well they don't some of our players they just you know but if you put it on a whatsapp you put the same length of detail on a whatsapp they'll read it because it's there and it's a platform they use all the time you know our guys are we, right. we've got multi-million pound printers and you know addicted to cod sometimes the best way for some of our management is to is to put the earphones on and and, uh, and join their group and and play cod with them online because that's the only way you're going to get their attention but um you know, we've we've got to adapt and we've got to move, but I do think this. You know, we've still got to treat everyone as an individual. Yeah, I mean, just can I just come back quickly on that? And just it's, a, to... it's a great point. For the individual. I was just going to say, just you know, psychometrically or psychologically, you know, there are definitive dichotomies, aren't there, in terms of big five traits or Myers Briggs, and thinking about extroversion, introversion, sensing, intuition, etc. And so. You know, to actually point about detail or big picture. I mean, these things are are still playing out with all of the generations. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of richness for sure. And then there's also some big sort of overarching thematic shifts. You know, to more openness, less control, more inclusion. I mean, if you're putting it in those three sort of psychological buckets, I would say that you know, increasing the amount of openness in organisations, decreasing the amount of control, and increasing the amount of inclusion are three really big levers at the sort of meta level that allow people to engage. Mm. That's great. Actually, I'm just going to come back to our two women's sports. Um, I mean, I think we've we've watched CNN a bit the uh, last couple of days, and it came up there, and it's just coming into the the chat as well. Of sports has taken a, a big hit during the pandemic, but I think there is more women's sport coming onto the focus. What, in your view, could be done in order to help support? this recovery or you know even there just creating a more diversified focus on sports for men and sports for women 
well, yeah, look, I can only speak from from our perspective, really. So, you know, the women's game, the women's uh, women's cricket has developed hugely over the last um, number of years. Uh, it doesn't fall into my remit, by the way. We have a separate um, MD for the women's game, but um, it has has now a massive following in our country. But clearly, through this process, through the pandemic, I think all businesses have been been forced to focus on what what pays the bills and put their investment mainly into that. Now that that has probably meant that women's sport that's not undervaluing or devaluing women's sport, but it's it's probably the simple balance of things at the moment. But we've made a commitment to the ECB that we will will continue to invest even through this this period. So. Our women's team, I think, are shortly due after Christmas to go off to New Zealand to play a series. They played a series at home against um, the West Indies. I think it was at, at you know really high expense. But we need to keep it alive. We both need to keep our, our athletes um, busy, motivated, and 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 keep their well-being um, up. And obviously, there's a there's a support base or supporter base out there as well, and and other partners such as Sky who who pay for rights to, to show this cricket. So it's absolutely important to our future. I can, I can uh, definitely say that. Thank you very much. Mark, I saw you nodding. Did you want to uh, just subject or would you like to uh, do your last question, which is due to the crisis, expect an acceleration of the change of, of management? Yeah, I mean, maybe I'll just res respond to that. I, th I think there has been a change. I mean, it is, it's varied a bit industry to industry over the last sort of nine months, my observation, and, you know, depending on how much one has been in, in crisis mode and just trying to keep head above water um, or how much people have been able to keep motoring forward. But I think the biggest shift that I've seen is the increase in flexible working. Um, and obviously because people have had to work from home and they've had to, you know, work through technology, that's definitely, I mean, a number of leaders have said to me that um, they were against working from home, they were against, you know, people being outside of an office. Um, and now because they've had to, they've seen it can work just fine. And so whilst I think we wouldn't want to move fully to an online model, because much of the stuff that drives engagement requires you to physically be with people. You know, if you think about practical things like, you know, how much, you know, fair and accurate informal feedback people get and so forth, it's so much easier to do a number of these things face to face. Um, but more flexibility is, the, I think, the thing that has accelerated. And I think it's definitely the thing to try and hold on to. Great. Thank you very much. Um, it's our time is up, but I just want to say thank you because it's really eye opening and very interesting. I love the, the engagement presentation, but also the way the boxes came together. And actually, I actually, uh, to be very honest, didn't expect the cultural changes in sports to have developed this far. And I think it's just something that is just simply eye opening. Um, and the way you both set out, um, you know, just some of the practical tools for. The leaders of now or the leaders of the future are great. So but thank you very much for, for having this conversation. No problem at all. Thank you. Bye-bye.